Welcome to Research Recap on J.P. Morgan's Making Sense podcast channel. I'm Joyce Chang, Chair of Global Research at J.P. Morgan. Today, I'm joined by Hai Binju, our Chief China Economist and Head of Greater China Economic Research. And we're here to discuss the key questions around China's economy this year. Thanks so much for joining today, Hai Bin. Thanks, Joyce. My pleasure to join the discussion today. So, hi, Ben. Let's start with China's growth. China's growth outlook has been top of mind for investors since the pandemic, first surprising on the upside and now disappointing a bit. China is not currently facing a hard landing, and it's continued to do these incremental stimuluses. And it's been able to hit the official growth targets of around 5%. But the recovery path has been bumpy and uneven, and there are concerns about the medium-term outlook and where potential growth is headed. Can you start us off by giving us a quick overview of how the economic recovery has played out since the reopening and how you're seeing the outlook for 2024? Sure, Joyce. There were two different types of narrative and also quite significant discrepancy between the market and policy makers in assessing the 2023 economic performance. From market perspective, market general view the post-reopening recovery in 2023 as weaker than expected. While the government interpreted the economic outcome 5.2% as achieving its growth target, around 5%. Second, policymakers and investors also use different benchmarks when assessing appropriate magnitude of policy easing, particularly that they also have different priorities when it comes to different policy objectives. Investors typically say that growth is most important, and some advisors argue China should shift to whatever it takes approach to increase the policy stimulus. From the government perspective, there are multiple policy objectives, so they do not think massive policy stimulus is necessary. Instead, they keep on reiterating to avoid massive policy stimulus. They also concern that there's a limited room for additional fiscal or monetary stimulus. Finally, in terms of the assessing the policy effectiveness, investment and policymakers also disagree regarding policy transmission channels, particularly from the gun perspective, the policy response will likely prioritize on the supply side. So what will happen in 2024, given that government's relatively benign view on the economic outlook and different thinking in the policy response, we believe that massive policy stimulus is not going to happen like the investors are hoping for. But the good news is that the both fiscal and monetary policy will become more growth friendly and they will actually coordinate together with each other. On the government side, we believe that the government will maintain growth target around 5% unchanged in 2024. This is a challenging, but not impossible. Our baseline forecast look at the 4.9% growth for 2024. Thank you so much for that, Haibin. So no massive stimulus in sight. And I think given the concerns about the size of the debt burden, that is probably a prudent thing for the Chinese to do at this stage. But I want to talk about another topic that is really at the forefront of the questions that we get over here in the U.S., and that's about the housing market. Housing has been a key challenge and a drag on the macro economy for a while right now with concerns about a double dip in the housing market. It seems to me that to stabilize growth this year, the government will need to step up policy efforts, including more forceful measures to stabilize the housing market. What do you expect from the housing market and the property sector this year? And are we going to see further declines? China housing market has been the biggest drag in the last two to three years and also is the biggest downturn in China's housing market since it was introduced in late 1990s. In 2023, China's housing market continued to decline and entered an overshooting stage. If you look at the key volume indicators from peak to bottom, the new home sales declined by roughly 50%. New home started declined by roughly 60-70%. And the government has introduced a serious incremental housing policy realization measures last August. But to be fair, so far, the housing policy realization is not sufficient to stabilize the housing market very soon. We believe that more easing will continue, but the challenge is there. Of course, the government can continue to relax the home purchase restriction policy or continue to relax the mortgage policy. But the main obstacle for the weak demand comes from the very weak income expectation from households, particularly upper middle income families. It also comes from the weak expectation for home price because most people still expect home price will continue to decline. So the better strategy for them is to keep on waiting rather than buy right now. The third one is the concern about the 
home delivery, particularly from private developers. So these are three key main obstacles and why the demand should stay weak in the housing market. And on supply side, the private developers' funding situation remain quite challenging. So from that perspective, our baseline scenario, we do not expect China's housing market will stabilize soon. But like I said, on one side, we do believe the government will continue to easing the housing policy. We assume a one trillion package, the fund that came from the PBOC, the PSA operation. And this one trillion package will be mainly to support the public housing. So that will help to offset the decline in the total real estate investment. This year, we expect that real estate investment would decline by only 2 to 4% versus last year, 10% decline. And economic impact coming from public investment, urban village renovation will lift the GDP growth by roughly half percentage point. And this is a very important assumption behind our relative constructive view on the economic outlook in 2024. Well, thank you so much for that, Haibin. I mean, we are looking at both a supply and a demand problem. And beyond that, just the concerns about weak income are another consideration. So it does seem to me like this problem is just not going to go away anytime soon. But I want to turn and just talk about inflation because everywhere else in the world, we're having this debate about the stickiness of inflation and whether we're going to come back to target. But taking a look at China, we see challenges that are completely different from other countries. China has been tackling very intense deflationary pressures. And when we look at China's CPI deflation, it actually intensified in January. Do you expect deflation to end? And what do you think policymakers can do to deal with the demand supply imbalance and the deflationary pressures? Yes, indeed, China is an outlier facing the deflation rather than inflationary pressure after economic opening. There are a bunch of factors why China facing the unique situation. China's policy has been obliged to support production and supply, but very little to support the consumption, supporting household sector. So that has been attributing to this imbalance between domestic demand and supply, why the core CPI inflation continue to move lower. But on the top of that, there's also other factors. For example, global commodity cycle is in downturn when China starts to reopen. On the domestic front, the housing market collapsed, meaning that the rental price is also moving down. But the most important factor for the headline CPI to turn negative back in 2023 is because pork price, a pork price declined by more than 30% last year. So China's CPI, PPI, and also GDP deflator all turned negative since the Q4 last year. And that is near term the biggest pressure. Of course, the government can shift the policy focus to consumption, but given the policy narrative, the probability is relatively low. So our baseline forecast for the inflation dynamics in China, we do expect deflation will end in 2024, mainly because the turning around in global commodity price cycle and also the turning around in the domestic pork price cycle. And these two are very important to end deflation. But inflation will continue to stay low because lack of the policy shift to fix the domestic demand supply imbalance issue. So that will continue to weigh on the China's market sentiment. That's very interesting. So we're not going to see deflation persist, but we're going to see very low inflation still in China from everything that you're telling us. Right, Joyce. Deflation or low inflation will continue to stay in China. Now, let's shift the direction a little bit, turning to you, Joyce. I know we have touched on China's policy and goals outlook. But in China's case, that they are also shifting focus from just economic growth to their multiple dimension policy objectives, so-called high quality growth by the policymakers. What are the implications for this shift on the global economy and the global financial market? Thanks for that question, Haydn, because that's really an ongoing debate. I mean, we see a five handle for growth this year, but as we look forward a decade, are we looking at something that's more of a three to four handle? And what is that going to mean for the global economy? But one thing I would say, and looking at the work that our global economics group has done, is that we've seen that the spillover from China's growth rate has actually gone down since the pandemic. And that's partly because we have seen U.S. exceptionalism play out. So it used to be that back of the envelope, we would say a 1% decline in China's growth is half a percent off of global growth. Now we think that's down to just 0.2% growth. So that's a pretty material change here. 
lot of that is about U.S. exceptionalism. And that's where the spillovers really do dominate. In the U.S., if you would take growth down one percentage point, you're looking at a 0.7 percentage point decline in growth over a year. So I think that China and the euro area have had a slowdown in the impact that they have when they slow down on the overall growth numbers. But it's still kind of a very asymmetric story because for emerging markets, particularly the commodity exporters, China has a much bigger impact. When we look at a commodity exporter, it's 1% off of China's growth is 0.7% off of commodity exporters, 0.6% off of emerging Asia. So we just still cannot deny that China, as the second largest economy, just still has an outsized impact, particularly on the emerging markets, although less so on the United States. Turning to the financial markets, China's equity and bond markets are ranked number two in the world. But I would have to say we're less worried about the spillover from financial markets. If you take a look at the foreign engagement in China's equity and bond markets, it's relatively small. So even though we have seen outflows, we have not seen something that is having an impact on global financial markets. There's been a lot of questions about the property sector, which you've already talked about. But we also see here that even though you've seen a very high default rate, roughly half of China's high-yield property sector has defaulted, foreigners are not the primary holder. So we don't see a systemic risk to global financial markets from some of the volatility that we've seen in China since early 2022. But this is something that we continue to monitor very closely because there's still very little that replaces China demand. Thanks, Joyce. Let's shift to another perspective. The supply chain diversification is another theme when China played a central role. Over the last four decades, China has become the global manufacturing hub, accounting for 30% of the global manufacturing value added and 15% of global merchandise goods exports. Going forward, China will remain an important hub, but the dominant role is shifting as the cost of production goes up. While it's not a new story, what kind of impact do you see supply chain relocation having on the global trade relations? Well, the first thing I want to say is that deglobalization is not yet a reality and decoupling from China is just not possible. That said, there is relocation of the supply chain that we're seeing. It's slow moving, but when we look at the business sentiment surveys from multinational corporates in the United States and the United Kingdom and in Europe, we do see some deterioration of business confidence in China. Now, that's really not so much about the growth story. A lot of that deterioration that we've seen has been around the uncertainties about China's regulatory measures. And that's hurt not just the foreign confidence, but the domestic private sector confidence as well. But when we take a look at the trade patterns, we do see some shifts not deglobalization, but we see that both the U.S. and China are directing trade away from each other. But you also have that Europe's reliance on China has actually increased. So I would not over-exaggerate the deglobalization arguments. But we've seen some moves in trade, not just Mexico, but we've seen that China's regional export share has increased in emerging Asia. We've seen that in the ASEAN countries, Vietnam and Malaysia have benefited the most from China's increase in outward direct investment. But I do want to say that multilateral businesses remain committed to doing business in China. It's very hard to replace China in the supply chain when you take a look at the scale, the infrastructure, and also the talent, you know, the trained engineers in the labor force. There are clear signs of diversification. But I would say there are very different strategies. Developed markets realize that they can't afford not to operate in China given the size of the consumer market. And if you're a company that's in China for the domestic market, I mean, you really haven't changed your strategy that much. In fact, you may have even increased the amount of investment you're doing. If you're in China for the regional market, there hasn't been such a major shift in strategy. If you're in China, though, for the U.S. market, this is where we've seen the biggest change right now. But longer term, I think that everybody still sees the potential in China when you look at the consumer spending power over the next decade or so. The U.S., because it's less impacted by a China slowdown, has probably been fastest to move some of the investment flows. But if you take a look at European and U.K. businesses, they're not so deterred by the slowdown in China's growth, which remains relatively strong when you compare it to their countries. But they are concerned about the policy regulatory environment. Thank you, Joyce, for the insightful comments. Yes, we do see actually the different multinational companies based on different models that they are responding to the changes 
Some actually stay in China, they continue to operate, but some actually are serving for the global market. As I said, they are containing the investment on China. So it's an ongoing thing we need to watch out. Well, thank you so much, Haibin, for being with us. A lot of food for thought here. First of all, We shouldn't expect a big stimulus package from China. They will continue to act more incrementally. And on the property sector, we're just not going to see a lot of relief forecoming. Low inflation seems here to stay, and foreign investors continue to assess the situation, but there's no decoupling from China given its role in the global economy. Thank you so much for sharing the outlook with us, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. And please take a look at Hai Binju and team's research Research on the top questions and concerns about the outlook for China and what to watch. You can find a link to the research in the description of this podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for listening to Research Recap. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll review, rate, and subscribe to JP Morgan's Making Sense to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. This communication is provided for information purposes only. Please read J.P. Morgan Research Reports related to its contents for more information, including important disclosures. Copyright 2023, J.P. Morgan Chase & Co., all rights reserved.